Kun is tea. How are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast and our series on mythic places. In this episode, we'll hear another tale of the Kailyuk. This time, she's closer to her home turf in the southwest, at Loophead. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon, and you can join them over at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one time donation to the PayPal button on our website. Like and share. And above all, enjoy. For now, Aaron, tell us a story. The Kayak of Loop Head A long spreading finger with grass that's soft like pillow, yellow and green underneath foot that would walk to the very south edge and look down below at a crashing wave upon this cliff. The kayak walks. Even in summer sun, she could stalk down to the east side and look right across at a small stack of stones where many birds have their homes to this day, looking down at the water crashing around it. A tall column of stone stacked high as if put there on purpose. Looking straight down and across at this stack, you would almost feel you could leap across the gap from the mainland to this stack of stone. Before the lighthouse was ever built, one tried this. One didn't quite make it. The kayak of Loop Head could stalk down to the southern side where the stones were flat and grew almost on either side of this peninsula. She stalked around, bringing winter winds even in summertime if her mood was not so sublime. The kayak, well known for the harbinger of death, bringing winter with it every time she threw her cloak and brought a great stormy cloud over this island, the winds whipping all around, the rain coming with it, stormy clouds and coldness always associated with the kayak. Those who know her are not afraid of her, for she is femininity as much as a young maiden, as much as a mother. The crone, even walking out there all alone, is wise beyond her seeing, and might not seem so, but has been watching for a very long time. The kayak is one of those people often discredit, not seeming to want to believe this person could have anything good to say. But this watcher and bringer of winter winds, well, a crooked smile always gives her thoughts away. Some say she watches still from particular spots beneath certain hills and a certain peninsula. This headland in the south, one of her homes. Though whether it's the same kayak who brings the winter, no one can be sure. She is an interesting woman to perceive covered in rags, worn for years, matted hair, scraggy and mottled, almost like a horse's mane, falling all the way down her back. The cloak wrapped around tightly on her shoulders that are stooped forward, her eyes 
looking like they're unseeing, clouded in behind, but something knowing is still there. Her crooked nose with warts and blemishes, hair protruding from the inside. Her skin not soft, but wrinkled and stained with dirt, mud, grease. Her teeth protruding from her lips even when she's not smiling or calling, sticking out at different angles like old gravestones sticking out of the ground, covered in moss, something different covering her teeth, but not wanting to get too close because of the breath and foulness, the stench of death coming between her lips, her fingers all crooked and pointed, old and haggard elbows twisted and pointing in different directions, her knocked knees, also a small limp as she carries her cane and walks down her old feet, almost pointed inwards and together towards one another, and at the very hem of her dress, almost unbelieving if one could see it, the long, scraggy hair of her pubic hair dragging along the ground. Or so the descriptions go, for those that have gotten close. The kayak always watched, and always saw a chance to test the greatest. The boys and warriors that wanted to become kings. Often the test was to kiss or lie with the kayak. The boys that wanted to be the great kings but could not get past such things as imagery and beauty often failed the kayak's test. The great Nile of the nine hostages, he lay with the kayak and she in the morning turned out to be a beautiful woman. So the kayak can often give and give graciously. Now there was one that she was watching, one brilliant boy who was a fantastic warrior. At an incredibly young age, this boy had gone to Awanmaka, to join the boys' troop of Ulster. His name then, Satanta. He won great acclaim for winning the name Ku Cullen after he killed Cullen's hound and took the name that would live on the lips of storytellers until the end of time for the great and many deeds he would do. And surely so he was destined to grow into the greatest man of Ireland. The greatest warrior, surely. Bound by honor and duty, he always obeyed his king. But does obedience bear greatness? The kayak had a test for this young boy. After watching so many of his great feats and battles won, She even watched with great curiosity for the feast at Bikru's hall. Bikru of the Bitter Tongue had set out a challenge for the men of Ulster to all arrive at the hall and claim the champion's portion. This would be a bragging right for the best warrior. Of course, the champion would have to be set and Ku Cullen demanded he was the best, and yet two more stood up against him that day to take the greatest portion of the feast. And the kayak watched with humor to see how the men of Ulster did not give in entirely to this brilliant warrior. Yes, he was a fantastic fighter, was he a great leader? 
two more being Conal Kerlach, the victorious, and Larry Buyuk, the battle winner. They were no match for the boy's skill. But Cúchulainn still had to prove his best, and numbers of challenges went until finally he passed a test. Cúroi MacDara, the Hound of the South, he sent a great giant to Ulster to lure these battle winners and victorious fighters into a challenge they could not win with purely strength. They had to give this giant their word that if they chopped his head off, he would be allowed to chop their head off. The kayak laughed as she whipped a wind around Ulster to send everyone into a frenzy. This giant coming to test their battle winners, their fighters, the best of the men of Ulster. The kayak laughed to see Conal Kjarnak the victorious with his forked beard chop the head of the giant and run away when he saw him stand up and pick up his head and offer to chop his head off the next day. The very same thing happened with Larry Buyuk, of course. The battle winner was able to chop the head off the giant, but terrified when he saw the giant offering to chop his head off, despite the little cut he had on his neck. The kayak watched and laughed to see Cúchulainn stand for this test a different time. When the giant picked up his head after Cúchulainn chopped it from the block, well, he did not run. He stopped and stayed and waited for the giant to chop his own head off after giving his word he would stay in exchange because Cúchulainn was honor-bound by duty and word and his word was his honor and the kayak's whipping wind went around to see all of the people of Ulster cry for the day they would lose the greatest warrior in Ulster. When the giant brought down the axe the wrong side up and left Cúchulainn with his head attached to his shoulders, the kayak thought maybe now the boy warrior could become kingly. This was what she thought. The boy warrior passed the test and was able to claim from that day on the champion's portion, named the champion of Ulster now definitely the greatest warrior and champion and leader in the land of Ulster of Ireland. But he still had not kissed the Kaya. So for love of this young boy, for longing, some say, for a lust that filled her, or for an attempt to test beyond doubt, could this boy warrior be brilliant? The kayak whipped a wind around the summertime, a chill went through those who felt it, and when she landed and offered her hand to Cúchulainn, he ran, but she chased after him. She bound as fast as a hound over the hills, and Cúchulainn, not fast enough to get away from the wind that whipped around, he continued to run as fast as his feet would carry him until he landed in the south of Ireland. Fully all the way down, the bottom of a great long peninsula, his feet on the soft grass that grew like pillows out of the rocks below. Not wanting to fight a woman, he turned and called to the kayak to leave him well enough alone. But the kayak kept walking towards him, 
puckering her lips, offering a kiss. A hand to simply touch, a cuddle was all she asked for. She kept on walking, hiking up her skirts, showing almost her ankles and the hair that fell down between. The air seemed to go still as Cucullin felt ill with the sight of her, the smell of her approaching, and so he took out his sword and he tried to hack her away. But the kayak is not so easily defeated. She brought her long nails clashing against the sword. The strangeness of it was she could attack him as fast and furious as any warrior he had ever faced, much more nimble and much more of grace than anyone he had faced till this day. Though stooped over and hunched as Kaya could move, she was furious at his refusal, her long mottled hair up in the air as the wind whipped around them, and she nearly danced around him as he danced backwards, hoping and trying not to be killed, he would not fall and spill into the ocean below. As he continued this fight, furious trying to get away from the kayak, this hag that loomed and lusted after him, he saw a long, thin stack of stone. And with a great salmon leap, he left the ground, flipping over in the air as the wind pushed him, and he landed there after this great leap, hoping the Kaya could not show off the great feat he had just done. But she did not look, and she leapt just the same way. But in a dismay and a cry and a call, she realized she would not make the jump and fall. And there Cucullin saw her fall all the way down, down, down the tall cliffs and into the water crashing below. The waves turned red with the kayak's blood. All over Loop Head the water became red crashing around the sound of the ocean turning Cucullin's stomach with the stench of death, the stench of the kayak he had refused. And he looked, and he saw the foam on these red waves still white. But something turned in him, something that told him he had not passed a certain test. Although he did not know, he leapt back from the stack of stones onto mainland, not sure what this was all about, and left that place in the south to return to his home in the north. But the kayak of Lupet, she was not dead. She had just transformed. She was there could still be there today, cackling and whipping her winds around the coast, waiting for the summer sun and the heat of the land to fall away so she could bring her winter winds, and so the time of death would begin again, and she may find another young man to test in the interim. This podcast was produced and edited by Ushin Ryan. You can find out more about us on our website, candlelittales.ie. And we're on all social media, so like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales or send us a message or get onto our mailing list. For more videos and live streams, like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel, which now has a Candlelit Tales for Kids playlist. Hashtag Candlelittle Tales. Liking and subscribing to our channel really helps us grow and get to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We also do really like to hear back from you with your questions and requests.
so please feel free to contact us directly or leave your question in the comments section below, because what we really want to do is get these stories out there, share them with as many people as possible, so anything you can do to help, we really appreciate. And we really appreciate you listening. Gurb Milamagat.